In this video, we're going to examine the leaked U.S. military document FM 3-39.40, otherwise known as the Field Manual for Internment and Resettlement Operations for U.S. Citizens. The official U.S. military documents we are about to see were highly classified until 2013 when they were leaked to the public. In fact, if you look at the bottom of the cover page, you'll see just how secret this document was intended to be. Destruction Notice Destroy by any method that will prevent disclosure of content or reconstruction of the document. By this statement alone, it's obvious that we were never supposed to see what's inside. And that being said, let's take a look inside and see what we can find. Now, this document is 326 pages long and we definitely don't have time to look at every single page. So I'll just go over some of the most relevant content. Feel free to read this document for yourself. There's a link to the full document in the description below. All right, so keep in mind that this document was not just written for overseas operations. It clearly outlines internment operations on U.S. soil and with U.S. citizens. On page 38, quote, support to civil support operations. Civil support is the DOD support to U.S. civil authorities for domestic emergencies and for designated law enforcement and other activities. Civil support includes operations that address the consequences of natural or man-made disasters, accidents, terror attacks and incidents in the U.S. and its territories. The internment relocation tasks performed in support of civil support operations are similar to those during combat operations, but the techniques and procedures are modified based on the special OE associated with operating within U.S. territory and according to the categories of individuals, primarily DCs. In this document, DC stands for Dislocated Civilian to be housed in internment relocation facilities. During long-term internment relocation operations, state and federal agencies will operate within and around internment relocation facilities within the scope of their capabilities and identified role. Military police commanders must closely coordinate and synchronize their efforts with them, especially in cases where civil authority and capabilities have broken down or been destroyed. Not only that, on page 146, it details the identification procedures of new prisoners, and that includes taking their social security numbers. Quote, Identification 716. Individual identification photographs are taken of all prisoners. The prisoner's last name, first name, and middle initial are placed on the first line of a name board, and the prisoner's social security number is placed on the second line. A prisoner registration number may be added on the third line. Two front and two profile pictures are taken of the prisoner. Fingerprints are are obtained according to AR 190-47. Now that we've established that these operations were not only designed for overseas, but also designed for U.S. citizens on U.S. soil, would it surprise you to see that the United Nations is also involved in this? Page 23. Agencies concerned with internment and resettlement. External government involvement in IR missions and IR means internment and resettlement, is a fact of life for military police organizations. Some government and government-sponsored entities that may be involved in IR missions include international agencies, the United Nations, International Committee of the Red Cross, International Organization of Migration, U.S. agencies, local U.S. Embassy, Department of Homeland Security, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, otherwise known as FEMA. It goes into more detail about the United Nations in Chapter 1-47. The UN is involved in the entire spectrum of humanitarian assistance operations, from suffering prevention to relief operations. Typically, UN relief agencies establish independent networks to execute their humanitarian relief operations. The UN system delegates as much as possible to the agency's elements located in the field, supervisory, and support networks are traced from those field officers back to UN headquarters. Military planners must familiarize themselves with UN objectives so that these UN objectives are considered in planning and executing military operations. So basically, the UN is there every step of the way and these camps must be formulated around UN policies, according to this document. Now, let's go to page 56 where it goes into detail about psychological operations or PSYOPs. The supporting IR PSYOP team has two missions that reduce the need to divert military police assets to maintain security in the IR facility. So basically, psychological operations are deployed in order to manipulate their detainees 
and make them more passive. And it goes into more detail. Quote, the PSYOP team develops PSYOP products that are designed to pacify and acclimate detainees or DCs to accept U.S. IR facility authority and regulations. PSYOP teams gain the cooperation of detainees or DCs to reduce the number of guards needed, identifies malcontents, trained agitators, and political leaders within the facility who may try to organize resistance or create disturbances, develops and executes indoctrination programs to reduce or remove remove antagonistic attitudes. Did you catch that? Develops and executes indoctrination programs to reduce or remove antagonistic attitudes, otherwise known as brainwashing. Now, let's move on to page 84, where it talks about medical support. And this is where it starts to get a little scary, if you take into account the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Quote, medical personnel are required to identify, treat, and document existing medical conditions and injuries of detainees. Commanders must considering the following when establishing medical care at the internment facility. A credentialed healthcare professional examines detainees monthly and records their weight on a DA form 2664-R. The detainee reporting system requires weight data from medical community. The general health of detainees, their nutrition and cleanliness are monitored during inspections. The detainees are examined for contagious diseases, especially tuberculosis, lice, louse-borne diseases, human immunodeficiency virus, Virus, which is HIV and STDs. Now, COVID-19 would definitely fall into this category. It goes on to say, quote, all medical treatment facilities must provide immunizations for and isolation of detainees with communicable diseases. Again, COVID-19 falls into this category. So basically what they're saying here is these facilities can be turned into a military quarantine with forced immunizations. Let's continue reading. Detainees who require a high level of care are transferred to military or civilian medical installations where the required treatment is available. Military police escort detainees to medical treatment treatment facilities and remain with them until medical examinations are complete. So if you're really sick, they might send you to a hospital. However, you will have military police escorting you there and back. All right, let's continue on. On page 115, it describes the serial number given to each detainee. Quote, internment serial numbers. The ISN or internment serial number is the DOD mandated identification number used to account for and track detainees. Once an ISN is assigned, it is used on all documentation, including medical records. The ISN is generated by the detainee reporting system. The detainee reporting system is the only approved system for maintaining detainee accountability. It is the central data point system used for reporting to the national level and sharing detainee information with other authorized agencies. Here is a nice diagram showing what the ISN is comprised of. Now, some people might say that these camps are friendly in nature and will be used as some sort of humanitarian camp to help people in need. Well, if it's a humanitarian camp, why would they need to use deadly force on people who try to escape? Page 238, quote, Level 5, Deadly Force, used as a last resort when all lesser means have failed or would be impractical used to prevent death or serious injury to self or others, to prevent the theft, damage, or destruction of resources vital to national security or dangerous to other, or, and here's the big one, to terminate an active escape attempt. So basically, deadly force is authorized to stop an escape attempt. That's everything we need to know right there. They also go into detail about how these camps should be laid out. There's many diagrams in this document and we're gonna take a look at this one right here. This diagram shows three rows of barbed wire fence, 25 guard towers, and a quick reaction force. Now, it should be obvious to anybody watching this that these camps are not humanitarian relief centers, but rather, Prisons. Prisons meant for large populations of U.S. citizens. And this video just scratched the surface of this nearly 400-page document. What do you think about this?